Welcome to the Craft to Career Podcast with Elizabeth Chapel, where every week we dive into how you can turn your craft into a successful career. Get ready to have the career you've always dreamed of. Hello, and welcome to episode 42 of the Craft to Career Podcast. This is Elizabeth Chapel of Quilters Candy, the host of the show. And this week we have a really fun guest. The conversation was just legitimately enjoyable. And the the guest that we had is just, he has some really great nuggets of wisdom. So it's Juicy Juice of <laughs> Juicy Juice. You're going to hear how to pronounce his full name, which I'm not going to try to do because I mess it up every time. But I cannot wait for you to hear from him and learn from him and hear how he has successfully turned quilting into his full-time career, what he does. Before we jump into that, I do want to share this week's review. It comes from Casey of Wellspring Designs. Casey was actually a guest on the podcast. It was episode 11 if you want to go back and listen. But I I did not know Casey before that podcast interview conversation. And I just loved her. We have become friends since then. And she left a review that I'm excited to share. It says the wisdom of experience. Elizabeth is such a gem. Her insights and conversations have been so valuable to me in the beginning stages of building a business. It's opened my eyes to the many avenues of success available within the creative industry and how amazing to learn from someone who has been there and eagerly shares the wisdom of experience. Casey, thank you so much for this review. It seriously was so fun having you on the podcast, and it's been really rewarding to see your business just take off and grow. You're doing super well, and I'm glad that this podcast has been helpful for you. So with that said, if this podcast is resonating with you, if you are enjoying the things you're learning, if you like the style of teaching and conversations that I have, Keep on your calendars in just a couple of days now, February 7th, 2022, until February 11th, the Craft to Career course will be opening. I open that once a year. It's six weeks long, and it's a deep dive where I will teach you how to really move the needle, how to grow your business, or if you're in the very beginning stages, how to make sure you're starting with the right foundation, that you're going to be focused, that you're going to pick a niche and start off on the right foot. So if that's something you're interested in, be sure to check out my website, quilterscandy.com. And under courses, you can learn more about the craft to career course. All right, let's jump in and let me introduce you to Juicy Juice. We have Juicy Juice here today on the craft to career podcast, and I'm so excited to have him. He's a busy man, hard to get a hold of, but I have had my eyes set on having him on the podcast. I'm so glad that you are here. So first of all, can you tell us how to pronounce your full name? And I'm not promising I'm going to say that correctly moving forward, but I'll try. <laughs> sure. My full name is Giuseppe Antonio Ribaudo. That's my official birth certificate name is Giuseppe Antonio Ribaudo, which means Joseph Anthony Ribaudo. Which, okay. you know, there's no translation for Robata. So, right. Robot. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've gotten that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roboto. Yeah. It's Italian, am I right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very and Italian. How far removed are you from Italian, like living in Italy? So, I'm first generation on my father's side and second on my mother's. Both sides of my family are actually from the same village in Sicily. So, oh, no. my whole family is all in um in one well not one village there you know now they're you know but the actual roots of the families are both from uh Castaldaccia in Sicily very cool yeah. you speak Italian I speak Sicilian oh yeah. okay so it's That's like a, cool. a dialect yeah okay it's a little more um it's a little harder sounding it's not it doesn't have the it doesn't have the I shouldn't say it doesn't have the musicality of Italian. It doesn't have the same musicality of Italian. Italian okay. like lilts a lot. It's really melodic and beautiful. But Sicily is um, like the working person's uh, language. So it's uh, a little bit of a harder sounding language. It's a beautiful language all the same. But Yeah. Can you say something like, uh, I love beautiful fabrics and quilting in Sicilian or something? I don't know know that. But. Sure, yeah. I don't know. Actually, I don't think that there is a word for... Um, quilting in Sicilian that I know of. Cusere is so is to sew. Mm-hmm. So 
mi piace um um mi piace robe um it mi piace cosere would be like what you would how you would say like i love fabric and i or, and i i love to sew okay yeah very cool mi piace cosere did i say that right mi piace cosere i can't even say your name right i can't like what am i feel like so i am well i don't know if you remember years ago i started with Quilter's Candy Box, and mm-hmm. I sent you a box back in the day, and now I'm putting you on the spot. You're going to have to say, yeah, I totally remember that. I do, I do remember that, honestly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, later, you have to tell me if you really do remember that. No, um, but I remember seeing you at a quilt market. This was six years ago. What can you tell me your story? I don't think at that time you were designing fabric. I'd love to hear your journey of getting into the quilting world and then your career, how what that looks like. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, at the time I was definitely not. I think when I met you, I had just started working for Andover Fabrics. Um, I had, I, I mean, it's all kind of, um, it's so funny, like, especially now with the last two years, like everything is like a blur of like, did anything before the last two years actually even happen? But um, yeah, so basically it started, my relationship with Andover started back when I was living in Chicago. Um, I had started by doing, I had like started to build a small name for myself and um, somebody who was working at Andover at the time sent me a big basket, a big box of uh, fabric of different fabric designers. And I did some promotional stuff with the fabrics that they'd sent me. And from there, I, um, I, was, I was doing theater at the time in Chicago. That's what I went to school for was, um, was theater. And so I was um, fortunate to be, you know, working as an actor in Chicago. And it wasn't quite what I thought or hoped it would be. Um, hmm. And so I just was like cast as like, you know, the funny fat guy over and over and over again. And it was just like getting boring. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up thinking... Well, you know, I had kind of built a name for myself a little, like really, really tiny at the time. And I thought I'm going to move back to New York, New York is where I'm from originally anyway. I thought I'd move back to New York and try to um, see if I could make some kind of career out of working in the fabric industry. It was something that I'd gotten really interested in. I would started researching a lot about not just um, quilting, but the process of actually making fabric and things like that. And it was just really like so for me, like once something gets like a hold of me, it's like a stranglehold and I can't stop thinking about it until like I like know as much about it as I possibly can, mm-hmm. which is why I like this industry because there's always, there's so much to know. Um, yeah. And so it's never, ever boring. It always stays interesting. And so when I moved back to New York, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll try to get a job at a theater. Um, I'm sorry. I'll try to get a job at a fabric company. And if that doesn't work out, I audition and I'm working as an actor, hopefully. And my life goes on the, you know, the same trajectory that I had always planned. So I got back to New York and I, um, one of the first meetings I had, I I had actually a really early iteration of a fabric collection, um, which ended up being quantum, which ended up being my first fabric collection. And I had a really super, super early, like, I'm just talking like sketches in a notebook draft. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went to Andover to pitch them this idea of a collection, like, you know, to show them, like, is this something that, you know, I, I, I had, a, I had made a friend there. And so I wanted to show it to her and see, like, is this like the seed of something? Like, do you think this could be something that Andover would be interested in? And I ended up, you know, I, sh- I ended up meeting with one of the vice presidents, um, a very good friend of mine to this day, Cliff, and um, my friend, Daryl, who, when I worked at Andover, was my work wife. And um, I met with the two of them and they ended up asking me, Instead of um, pursuing the fabric thing, they asked me, would you like to come to Quilt Market with us for a week? Um, to We need somebody to help us with the booth. And I thought, that sounds really fun. And um, Unbeknownst to me, it was a working interview. And so oh. I had no idea. I was like my foul mouth self. Like, <laughs> like, I was just cursing left and right. Like, I mean, like mouthing off with like the president of the company right there. Like not thinking, I had not a care in the world. I just thought, this is a great fun trip, you know, to to like something that I would never get to do otherwise. And so when we got back to New York and you know, I went in thinking they, they said, we want to talk to you about job opportunities. So I went in thinking it was an interview, but they were, it was actually a job offer. And so, wow. and that was, um, that was how I started working with Andover. And then, so from there, I kind of, I saw it as an opportunity to, to just learn as much as I possibly could. I mean, like how many people who are aspiring to do fabric design get, 
a job at a fabric company dropped in their laps. Seriously. And so I was like, this, you know, let's do it. You know, I was hired in the marketing department and I had, I, um, that was really fun, exciting and challenging. And, um, you know, I started, I started out small and then eventually I was in charge of basically everything customer and consumer facing alongside my counterpart, Daryl. And like we, you know, did all of the the ads for magazines and the booths for all the trade shows. And I got to do like the, um, we call them like fabric caps, you know, like the things that we show the fabric collections to the shops on and stuff. I got to, to like design all of those, like organize them all. It was really, it was just the best job. It was so much fun. And I learned so much. And I would basically just like scooch past the design director whenever she'd be working at the big studio table in the middle of the office and just um, like bug the crap out of her with questions. <laughs> just, just, just like ceaselessly ask her just question after question after question. She was a real sport about it. And then finally, after like two or three years, I felt like, okay, I think I'm ready. Like, I feel like I've learned a lot and I'm ready to, you know, put pencil to paper again and circle back. And I went right back to that, right back to the well of that first collection, um, the, the, the genesis of that idea. And the collection ended up being just so much. I, I think if I had, if I had just been, if Andover had taken me on and I had designed fabric for them, I think I would have just released a collection, maybe two or three, and then I would have been done. But having the opportunity to be able to learn from, I mean, real garmentos, like we're talking about like Andover Fabrics is like in the center of the garment district in Manhattan. Like it's like right there in the thick of it. And I mean, one of our vice presidents, Mark has been a garmento working in New York city for, for years and years and years and years. So just to be able to be able to work with people who are that knowledgeable about the industry, who have seen the industry shift and flux and change through so much was just like, I mean, it's like, it was just such a blessing, truly. And so, so I'm curious why you think it was different. If you had started off as just a designer, why the difference? Is it just because the passion learning about it or? I think that I, well, when I first approached Andover, it was like back when, like if you just had like a certain amount of followers on Instagram, they were offering people fabric collections. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure that I mean, I'm sure that there were plenty of people who were actually designing their collections. I'm sure there were also people who were having like shadow designers, like, you know, people who actually work in the studio, uh, design, you know, doing art for the, um, the, whoever that personality was, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, it would, I just, I don't think that I would have known enough to keep going. I don't think that I would have, I, I just don't, I don't like, I mean, there's still so many things that I, that I got to see in those, like th those, I worked at Andover for, for four years and there was so much that I got to see that I just have like filed in the back of my head of like, that would be cool to try someday. That'd be cool to try someday. I, because we have, I mean, there's a great big world outside of our modern quilting cottons, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is like a multi-billion dollar industry and the modern section of it is just a tiny little part of it. Yeah. And there's so much stuff to be gleaned from, from people who have been designers for like 30, you know, years and things like that, you know, there's just so much to know and learn. And so that was the best thing. I mean, like so much of what I learned from watching like them work on reproduction, like, like for instance, my new collection, Nonna uses reproduction florals, you know, existing mm -hmm. florals that we then, you know, changed. And, um, you know, so one of them was from a dessert plate from my grandmother's house. Like the, that, just that process alone of taking something, and like taking it exactly as it is, changing the colors, maybe a little bit brightening it up and then applying it to something really modern. I don't think that that's a place that my brain would have gone had I not seen the process of like like an archival piece of fabric turning into a new design or something like that, you know? I am like envious in the best way about your life right now. I would <laughs> love to be in New York, in the garment district, learning and seeing the things it actually just excites me and lights me up. I wish I had another life where I could like go and do that. It sounds so cool. It was a true blessing. It really was. I thank my lucky stars for it every day. I, I like, I mean, and like, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy to say, but the people at Andover truly are like an extension of my family. Like they have my back completely. That's the best thing about Andover too, is that your vision is what, like when you see my fabric, that's what I wanted the fabric to look like. There's so many fabric companies where you send them your designs, they color them for you, they send it to you, and that's what your fabric collection looks like. And it's yeah. just not like Andover is, you are absolutely getting the exact vision of the designer when you see the fabric. And to that freedom is, is unheard of in, yeah. at many other companies.
Well, and do you, I'm curious on the design side, do you use Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop or your I use, iPad? So I use a combination of lots of different things. Um, I don't, so the, the way that I approach fabric design is I think a little bit different from other designers because I didn't, I wasn't a designer. I was a quilter. I've always been a quilter, you know? So I kind of feel like I end up reverse engineering a lot of my designs. Um, I like, I'll think of a design and then try to figure out a way that I can, cause I'm, I'm not a painter, you know, I can draw. Okay. But mm -hmm. I'm not like, you know, I'm not an artist by any means. Um, so I, I, I will think of an idea and then try to figure out, okay, how can I make that idea happen? And so sometimes it means using Illustrator. Sometimes it means using Photoshop. Sometimes it means using Bolt. Sometimes it's hand drawing it. Um, sometimes it's dyeing things. Um, sometimes it's, you know, throwing paint on paper and seeing what happens. And um, that's the really fun thing about, I, I think about, like, I, I feel like I'm constantly trying to find creative solutions for, to get my, I mean, I don't like to use the word vision, but you know what I mean? Like the mm -hmm. ideas in my head to get them across, yeah. I, you know, like I have to always find a creative way. And th that's my skill set. I think is like, is creativity. So to always like being like, okay, how do I, I have an idea for something. How do I do it? How can I get it onto, on like, forget about onto fabric, just get it onto paper to translate it to the studio, you know? Yeah. So it's always different. Um, every line I'm working on a, on, on a new little group that's going to ship um, in the fall uh, this week. And this one's all going to be hand drawn. I'm trying some new tricks that I saw, tri tricks, sorry, that I saw for um, um, fun little ways of um, interesting ways to do repeats and stuff like that. So I'm always just watching more videos and, and reading and learning and I, like whenever I go to New York, I always have a thousand questions in my back pocket for the design director. So, you know, so you're not in New York. Where are you? No. So I moved to um, I moved to Maine. Um, oh, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, I moved to Maine about oh, over a year ago now. Um, okay. Yeah, we um uh, yeah the pandemic in a New York City apartment. True. Yeah, it just uh, after about five or six months, we were just like, you know what? Can't do it anymore. Yeah, I think a lot of people did that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, well, okay, finding an apartment up here was it was a living nightmare. We're from my my, my significant other's from up here, so we had that. Like, at least he like knows where everything is. Mm -hmm. You know. Um. So, but yeah, we're in Portland, Maine. Um. We have a really a, a, my apartment actually here is somehow smaller than my apartment was in New York, which is insane. <laughs> But at, yeah, but at least here there's like trees and fresh air, so yeah. <laughs> so it's a trade. Well, I love Maine. We've been through, we went to Bar Harbor and then we went to Vermont, where Ben and Jerry's is. I have a little piece of my heart is in that part of the world. Like it's in beautiful. New England, yeah. It's I lovely. mean, it's very cold and wintry right now. It's not so bad today. Today was a balmy 36, and I was like, I'm going to go outside and take some pictures today. So yeah, perfect. It wasn't so bad. But yeah, like two or three days ago, it was um, when I was I was I think zero i think it hit zero that's the lowest it's been so far this winter is zero okay but we got another two months so we'll see it, yeah, it wasn't that bad you know yeah so okay i'm curious with your story going back you said you were kind of like getting yourself out into the quilting world when andover invited you to come to quilt market was that in the form of a blog or how did you have a presence it was all oh i only had instagram and, okay. I, and that's actually a real point of pride for me. I actually, to this, I'm working on it now. I finally have to do it. But I have not had a website. I've not had a blog. My stories, I'm very, like, my, I, like I, it's, I, it was kind of a point of pride for me. I'm, there was a person who I, who I won't name, who's a, who's a very lovely individual and who I really do hold in high esteem. But um, she would keep telling me every single time she saw me, you need to have a blog. You have no future in this industry if you don't have a blog. And I was just like, I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of doing it already. Like I have a job at a fabric company. I feel like, I feel like I did it. <laughs> like, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm not really struggling right now. I could pay my bills working, working in the quilting industry. But every time that she would see me, she would say, you, you will not have any future in this industry without a blog. And, um, and I think blogs are great. I really do. Like they're awesome, but it's just not for me. Like, it's just not. Mm -hmm. I like as little tech as possible. I mean, like, e like plugging headphones into a laptop and clicking on a link to do an interview was stressful for me. So yeah. <laughs> like, it's just not, I'm not wired. Like I'm not a technological individual. It's just not, it's not how I am. Um, 
I remember like when we, I feel like when we had, like we got our first computer, I had my computer like at our house, like five years after everybody else. Cause my, my mom was like, okay, I guess it's not a fad. I guess we have to like, we have to do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like tired of going to school at four o'clock in the morning to like type my papers and stuff like that. So, oh, um, nice. but yeah, it's just not, that's, but so that was a real point of pride for me was like getting as far as I can in this industry with just a little Instagram account. Um, I love that. I, I, even the way you approach art, it's very scrappy, if you will. Like it's very, you're going to figure it out and you're going to make it work. And and I love that. I actually think it takes a bit of that to be successful. Like a lot of times people will be like, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do this. And it's worked for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But if you're good and creative, you can go many different routes to find success. And you are living proof of that. So it's very cool. Thanks. I appreciate that. I, I find, I mean, you do have to, you have to be scrappy to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't like, you know, one of the, you know, I mean, I had, there were so many great nuggets of advice that our former design director, um, our, our current design director, Karen is a great friend of mine and I love working with her. Um, but I started with our Kathy Hall, our older design director. She's the person who kind of started, um, you know, teaching me before I'd met Karen. And she, uh, one of the greatest pieces of advice, the one of the greatest things she ever said was, you're never, ever going to get rich designing fabric. You need to have other forms of revenue. You need to, you know, it's like, the, it's not like, you know, you're never, I'm, I'm probably never going to be a multimillionaire as a fabric designer, but, you know, like, but between the teaching and the fabric design and, you know, whatever else, all of those little tiny things all together make for, you know, a fine life. I mean, I don't, like, yeah. I, I all have to do is pay my bills, so... Right. You know. so, and that's an interesting question. So of the pie, like, let's say we have a financial pie. What are the different areas? You mentioned teaching, you work at Andover, fabric design. Are there other areas too? Yeah. So I actually don't work at Andover anymore. I actually, oh. left, yeah, I did right before that, right before the whole COVID thing. I thought if I, if I, if my, if, if hindsight were 2020 and I would have seen that a giant pandemic was coming, I probably wouldn't have chosen to quit my job right before 2020. Right. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Yeah, I know. Exactly. So I, I, I left Andover literally a month before the pandemic hit. Well, um, shoot. Yeah. The end of December was, was when I left Andover. I think it was, the end of, it might've been the end of November, but either, I, whatever, the end of 2019. And so I had a whole bunch of stuff planned. The big, the biggest chunk of the pie for me is teaching. Okay. That's that's the biggest part for me, and it's my favorite part. I love teaching; I absolutely adore it. Um, I I I'm not such a fan of the Zoom version of it, but the in person stuff is definitely for me. Um, yeah. So that's the, the biggest part of the pie is the teaching. Um, after that, the fabric design. Um, eventually, pattern sales will be another part of the pie. It's not. I, I don't love writing patterns. I love designing patterns. I don't love writing patterns. Yeah. Um, so, but that's eventually, you know, it's kind of a necessary evil as a fabric designer. Like you can't, you can't release something that, that's been the hardest thing to rectify for me is sometimes I want to make something just because I want to make it. Like I don't, I don't, not everything I design, I design thinking I want everybody to be able to make this. Sometimes I want it to be mine. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and that's a hard thing to, to, to kind of, uh navigate sometimes because the second that I post anything new or different or original I have like three dms saying you know when will the pattern be available yeah. and so that stresses me out a lot and it kind of stifles me a little bit from designing new mm -hmm. patterns and things like that it's a little, a little easier to just design you know, like make something out of somebody else's patterns you know right yeah um, which I enjoy as well so it's kind of a win-win but um anyway yeah so that but those are the biggest parts of it um um, you know, I have like a little pop-up shop that I take with me when I go, when I teach at guilds and stuff like that. That's a little tiny part of the pie. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just all those little things, you know, um, product, um, design will be something that I'm going to be playing with very slowly integrating it. That's, I think the most important thing in my opinion is like to just take your time, um, adding new elements to the casserole, you know, yeah. um, you know, it's just, uh, if you, if you like, I, I just feel like if you throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, you're just like, you're going to get way further slowly integrating things and taking your time and learning it and knowing it. And no, because then the next time that the opportunity comes out to start something new, you've done the legwork. 
so you can yeah. focus the energy. You're like, okay, I know what goes into that. I know what the investment is. I know what the ener- the, what the investment of money, the investment of energy, the investment of time. I know what all of those things are, the creativity, whatever. So you can nip that in the bud and then you can move on to focusing on whatever other new adventure, you know, might come your way. Um, yeah. And I see also when people try to do all the things at once, A, your audience is confused, but B, they're just burned out and they're like, well, nothing's working. I'm giving up. It's like, Ooh, well, if you do the one thing, it's just, everyone's happier, you know, yeah. it works out better. I feel like so. Yeah. A lot of my collections this past at the end of last year, going into the beginning of this year, because of just delays with COVID and stuff ended up all kind of coming out at really similar times, which is really kind of, um, it's hard as a solo business person. Like you're trying to promote, like I have four collections shipping within four months of each other. <laughs> it's, you know, and they're all like, they all work together. So I can like, you know, I can put them all together, but as a consumer, as a shop, first of all, so like the customer, when, when we talk about the customer, we mean the quilt shops. Mm-hmm. And then when we talk about the consumer. Of course, we mean the person who is buying from the quilt shop or whatever, let's say. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's just, it's hard for on everybody. It's hard to, um it's hard to keep track it's hard to know what fabric is from what it's hard to hard to get it all like as a consumer like you know if you're fortunate enough to have people who really like your stuff it's hard to stay on top of it when every month you have a new collection to buy from a designer so you know it's um that's been challenging but at the same time creatively it's really fun because I feel like I have like so many colors in my crayon box right now to play with for quilts and stuff like that so for me it's a dream yeah you know just as like wanting to sew with all with all sorts of stuff it's awesome yeah. But, you know, for other people, it, it can uh, be a little. Yeah, it kind of sucks. <laughs> well, it, so I'm so intrigued by the fact that people will ask you when is the pattern coming out and that stresses you out because I know most people I would talk with would die to have that reaction. Like, yes, people want my stuff, you know? So that's a very interesting take on it. Why? Why? Tell me more about that. Because I don't, I just really don't. I just really hate the pattern design process. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hate the pattern writing process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just really, it's just not, um, because there's so many people who are really, really, really good at that in our industry. Mm-hmm. And I don't like to, I don't like to put my name on things that I don't 100% feel like I'm, I'm good at this. Okay. You know, like I have the confidence to know that when I'm putting this out into the world, it's, I, it's got the juicy juice seal of approval. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's ways to rectify that. Like I have, you know, a tech editor that I, I have a pattern that's literally been written. It's done. It's written. It's in PDF form. I have had it printed. It's like gone out into the world. Like it was a part of like an advent calendar. So it got sent out to, you know, the people who it was a, you know, part of that thing. Yeah. A, over a year has gone by. I'm, I have seen people make the pattern. I have not heard anybody say this is wrong with the pattern. Right, yeah. And and still, I'm completely stifled by like the anxiety <laughs> of like having to actually just like push the button and, and put it out for everybody. Yeah. Um, Did you ever? I mean, what are your thoughts on a ghostwriter of someone to write it for you? I've totally thought about that. I've totally totally thought about that. And you know, we we do something similar like that at Andover, like for instance, with our free patterns. Um, Mm -hmm. we're very fortunate that we have a lot of really talented designers who are, or really talented designers and pattern writers that, you know, that you just, you send them your design. You, you, I, I I do a mock-up, a digital, you know, an illustrator or whatever. I send them exactly what I want the quilt to be. I send them the dimensions and then they do the arduous task of actually putting it in pattern form. Yeah. Um, And that's awesome. (laughs) I could totally deal with that. (laughs) But the thing is, yeah, I have to like, you know, like, but I've been too, like, if I'm putting a pattern out with my name on it, I want it to look the way I want it to look, yeah. you know, I mean, like, aesthetics are pretty important to me, you know, mm-hmm. so it's got to, like, look like I did it, and so, but yeah, and it's also, like, I feel like in the past two years, I've just, like, more than ever, like, I want to work on the things that make me happy, Yep. you know, I just don't, like, time's fleeting, and... Totally. You know, and I can tell that you love what you do. So it's kind of hard to throw something in that you don't love when why? You that's know? the thing. Yeah. It's not like, I mean, it's not such, I mean, like I know I have, I have friends tell me all the time, like you need to do like the, cause I know the pattern writing can be very lucrative, mm-hmm. you know, it really can be. And especially if you're fortunate enough to have people who want to make your patterns, that that's yeah. a real, that's a real blessing. Um, but I mean, I mean, it sounds stupid, but like I didn't become a fabric designer because I wanted to be swimming in cash. I became a fabric right. designer because I like, because I love it. 
I, I like to call the shots and I like to do what I want to do. And I like not having to answer it to anybody, you know, and there's freedom in that. I mean, I don't yeah. know, listening to you, I'm like, maybe don't do the pattern writing. Why? You know, just because someone said you should like, well, it's kind of like the blog thing, you know? Exactly. Well, that's the thing is that I've gotten this far just doing what my gut tells me are the things that I should focus on, you mm -hmm. know, because like, I don't, I mean, I don't write as many patterns, but I know that I get to teach a lot more than a lot of people get to teach, yep. you know, because that's, that's a main staple of my business, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you can find something that is the thing that makes you really happy and people want you to do it, focus on that. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, it's fabric design and teaching. Those are the things that I love doing. And, you know, maybe I make a little bit less money than somebody who does all three, but I don't really care, you know. But I'm not convinced that their happiness level is any higher, you know. That's so. the thing. Exactly. That's exactly it. Like, I mean, if I, you know, I I want to keep loving my job. Yeah, exactly. And loving um, life. and Yeah. So I'm curious if you have any insight. You mentioned just briefly, you touched on Andover. At, at, well, and all fabric companies at a certain point were kind of like, if you have a following of X amount of people, we'd love to have you as a fabric designer. What kinds of things do companies look for in just generally speaking, not, not that you're some rep talking for Andover, but what, what kinds of things do companies look for for a fabric designer? If a listener is thinking that could be kind of cool. Well, I don't think that it, I don't think it works like that anymore. Okay. I don't, I don't think you have people who are, um, it's, it's pretty rare, like, because there are people who have really, and I think proof of that is that in the past, I think it's funny. I remember talking with my friend, Nicole, uh, modern handcraft on Instagram, when we were talking about how we were like the new kids, you know, like we were like, she and I lived around the corner from one another in Chicago. And we were talking about how we felt like we were like just starting to build up our, like who we were, you know, people were starting to take notice and like, you know, like you'd wake up in the morning, you'd have like 15, 20 new followers and stuff like that, that that was all really new to us. And we were talking about feeling like, um, like being the new people in, in the industry and like thinking about, I wonder what the people who've been around for a while think about when new people come into the industry and now we're the old timers, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in comparison to other people, like I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do, to have, well, it's, it's been a job that's paid my bills for like maybe four or five years, but mm -hmm. I've been doing this for like a decade. And so it's, um, there's so many, sorry, to get back to what you were asking, there's so many new people on the scene who have, lots and lots of following who are great pattern writers but you don't see them releasing fabric collections yeah and so that is in large part because i think fabric companies have stopped re reaching into that well of like saying you have a lot of because because it takes more than having a following to sell a fabric collection yeah. and that's i think was a lesson that was learned you know by the industry by the the people up in the industry uh I think that they figured that out. Like, oh, it takes more than just having thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand followers to sell a line. Mm -hmm. you, you need to know how to market the line. You need to be, you know, it, it's just it's a heck of a lot more than that. And so, um, I would say, like, if you like, to me, what what the, what they look for, and in and right now is like a weird time, right? Like, it's a strange time to like bring somebody new on board like it's a weird time to take a chance on a new designer you know yeah um, because people are i think in many many industries are hold like like keeping things a little bit close to the chest right now mm -hmm. um, and rightfully so because who the heck knows where the next year is going to take us yeah. so but i would say if you want to do fabric design that for me like you better have something different to say because we have, we have a lot of, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. There's nothing wrong with beautiful floral designs and, you know, like painterly flowers and things like that, or like, you know, geometrics or there's nothing wrong with any of that, but we have a lot of it. Yeah. And so if you want to make a name for yourself as a designer, you got to bring something different. You know, I know for me, different has been a big part of my, like my whole thing, I think is just like be different. Mm -hmm. and, and it comes easily for me because I just have like really weird niche interests. <laughs> so, awesome. and, and I'm very fortunate to have a fabric company that's like, yeah, do a line about aliens. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'm so it's a weird, like I'm, I, again, I, I can't, I can't um, hammer this home enough. I'm really, really lucky to be working for the company that I work for. 
um, because they really do value the vision of the designer. Um, but that's, I think, the big thing. I mean, like, we don't need another designer to do, like, painterly florals. We've got that on lock. We have so many people who are, I mean, like, like Rifle Paper Company is, like, yep. really good at that, yep. you know? <laughs> Real good at it. And so you need, if, if it's something that you really want to do, I think, and, and what I did was I found something that I didn't feel like was being, was, was being touched on in a way that was um, super accessible. So for me, it was like, originally was like science and science fiction. And, um, you know, like, I can't tell you the amount of mathematicians or engineers who've sent me messages talking about how they're so happy that they finally have something that looks like their aesthetic, like their style. Mm, cool. you know, so that, that was for me, that was like, a, and it wasn't even, I didn't plan that. That's just like, right. what I, that was just what I like, you know, I didn't, yeah. I wasn't like, what, how can I get mathematicians interested in fabric design? Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just um, try to, you know, uh, but that was my way in was like, you know, I, I just thought I'm going to just do because I can't like, I mean, I feel like if I did, if I put unicorns on fabric, it would feel phony. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's just not who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like a big thing. Like, you know, I, it, it, and that's, what's hard about it. And I think that that's why we see less and less new designers coming onto the scene is because um, like, I, for, I forget her name. I'm so, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. I forget her name, but the, 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 the astronaut who has a new line for Kaufman, her first fabric collection is, yeah. is like based off of like, photos that she took from space like that's freaking cool yes it is you know and that's new it's brand new it's new like we haven't seen you know like that's some that's like really like like to see terrain from that far and to see it translate to fabric is super exciting you know mm -hmm. yeah like, that's really neat I'm, I'm i'm embarrassed that i'm that i'm spacing on her name right now you know? so mm -hmm. but it's really like and, and granted you know she is an interesting like you know, not many of us are going to be able to go up into a spaceship and take pictures. <laughs> right. So it's truly unique. <laughs> right. But that's the great, like how cool though, that like, you know, that she took what she is naturally, like what she does. And she found a way to translate it something for us as quilters mm -hmm. and makers. Like, I mean, come on, that is so stinking cool. Yes, it is. So I heard someone say, and tell me your thoughts on this, which I really liked. I had toyed with the idea of designing fabric. I just don't know that it's in my cards for so many reasons, but, um, Someone gave the advice, one, you should have something unique. And two, if from a mile away, someone should be able to recognize that is your thing. And I think of the people who are super successful, you included, you can see it and spot it and say that's theirs. It's just unique. Like Tula Pink, I mean, just the people who are big, right for paper company, you know, they, they've got their look nailed down. And it's the same with any, any brand. I don't know. I don't know. Thoughts on that? I think that that's absolutely the truth. Absolutely. And that's not, um, that's a hard thing to nail down, right? Like mm -hmm. Tula, Tula didn't, I, I really doubt it. I, I have never spoken to her about this in particular, but I don't think that she set out to have her look be her thing. She designed from her heart and that's mm -hmm. what came out, you know? Yeah. Um, so for me, the, I think the root of what you're getting at is, is just authenticity. Mm -hmm. is is just and you know i talk about this a lot in my i have like a photography and branding workshop that i teach i talk about authenticity a lot in branding because and i mean i'm i'm fortunate that i stand out in our industry because i'm different in many ways like i'm right. like my style is different but also like i'm i'm a dude i'm a big mm -hmm. bald guy like you know <laughs> like i stand out in lots of ways but i don't think that my my work doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like that's like a like a hallmark of my work that I'm right. like a guy who you know like you know I don't know it just doesn't feel like that to me yeah but what does what is mine though what does come from me is that the things the collections that I release I I have a vested interest in what I'm what I've designed you know the first one was quantum and it was like a little homage to all of the little like to like science fiction and stuff like that um Declassified was very much my love of alien sci-fi horror and and those kind of, and like themes like that. Um, my new collection with my grandmother's house, you know, and so that's I think the way in is it has to be if it's truly you, if you're revealing something of yourself, then it will always be authentic. It will always be unique when you're sharing something that people don't already know about you. Um, I love that. And I think that that's the big thing. I mean, because again, like, 
you know even like in like i mean um like you know rifle with the florals and stuff like that they're unique to mm-hmm. her they're not generic florals they're her florals I and mean, we see people knock them off all the time yeah, we do. and and they never and never ever achieves what she does because it's her it's her yeah you know and it's funny when i see that i'm like oh that's you're doing rifles thing you know yeah. like mm-hmm. it is it, it came from within her mm-hmm. and i have to say too just on this topic of authenticity but kindness so i have a friend cheryl tessator and she met you at quilt market and she is always like my friend peace up or she, i don't she's like <laughs> he reached out to you about being on the podcast because i was mm-hmm. like i reached out i can't get in touch but she said when she met you you had some scraps and you didn't know what to do and you gave them to her I and mean, she just she connected and she is not a big name and you know i mean she you were so sweet and so nice to her. And I just think that speaks to who you are. And it's really cool to see that, you know, behind the scenes, like, Oh, he's a really good guy for real. Even when it doesn't matter, you know, not that she doesn't matter. Sorry, Cheryl. That's not (laughs) (laughs) good one, Elizabeth. (laughs) No, I think you're, I mean, I have, I, I mean, well, first of all, I think we could all stand for a little, with a little kindness right now. I think we all just Mm -hmm. need to be, as kind to one another as we possibly can and like, you know, truly genuinely be kind to one another. Um, and I think, I mean, I've met, um, I've met people who I really admired in this industry and was, and I was disappointed by who they were. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's hard thing to hold somebody in high esteem and then, be like oh wow I wish I hadn't met you like it's all soured for me now Mm -hmm. you know like and so and I mean I mean I'm I'm Sicilian we can hold a grudge like it's like you know it's not easy for me to let go of things like that but you know I would just really hate for somebody to I mean like it's just I'm just a quilter like I mean I'm a quilter who has a really great job but like I mean I'm really just like like I would appreciate if somebody handed me a bunch of fabric scraps too, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. Like, I, that's really nice. I think that that's really sweet that she, that, that, that memory stuck with her because like, you know, everybody, like if you have extra fabric, give it to somebody, you know? And that is really, really cool. <laughs> and so I guess to wrap it up, I'm wondering if you have any words of advice to someone who wants to start a creative business, whether it's in the quilting world or or anywhere, and we've touched on a few things, but if you had just one over, overarching, overarching, I never know how to say that, uh, <laughs> word of advice, what would that be? I would say take your time. Um, really take your time and really slowly, just really, really take your time. And that can be really, really hard. I, I toyed with quit, like I, I felt like when I, when I started designing fabric is when, and like the, fir- the first collection went really well and I was, you know, got to do a second collection. I was like, okay, I can do this for a little while now. Like, I think I can, I see longevity in this. And so I was itching to quit and over the day job, mm-hmm. not because I had, I loved doing it, but I was mm-hmm. getting a lot, like, you know, with fabric, with, with having fabric out in the world, it means, you know, you get more opportunities to teach, you get more opportunities to do this, that, and the other thing. And so it was just getting really, really hard to juggle being having a nine to five and then having a six to 1 a.m. So it was just really, really, really hard. But I'm really, really, really glad that I took as long as I did to, for a bunch of reasons. One, because the future is uncertain and you don't know what, when there's going to be a pandemic. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But just to like, I, I think you really need to, you need to long to do the thing that you want to do a little bit before you can have it. You need to pay your dues. You need to work really, really, really hard for way longer than you think you need to. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very, very fortunate to have what I have, but I had can't tell you the amount of all nighters that I pulled working two jobs at the working two full-time jobs at the same time. And I work my butt off and I'm so happy I did. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I just, I would go into work and I, cause I, and that was, that was hard too though. I mean, I, I was fortunate too that I had a job that I really liked too. Like I loved my job yeah. in Andover, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's not, so it wasn't easy to walk away from that, but I had to for my well being. It was just like, 
you know, too much. But I think that taking my time, really slowly building it, slowly learning what my limits were, slowly, and then, and just continuing to go slowly. Like, you know, when I have people, you know, saying, when is that pattern coming out? When's that pattern coming out? Having the wherewithal to say, I'm sorry, it's not ready yet. I'm one person. I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm designing four collections for the rest of the year and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And it's just not a priority right now. I'm sorry. You know, having the ability to say no, I just recently started saying no to things that I don't feel like will give me any kind of joy, really. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, just like not saying yes for the sake of saying yes. Um, But truly, I really think the best thing you can do is really just take your time. Really, really take your time and make sure you want it. Make sure you really, really want it because it's going, there's going to be hard days way more than there's going to be easy days. So, you know, I know for me, my, my goal, I hope one day that I'll have a quilt shop, you know, that's like, would be something I'd really love. I want to have a quilt shop that's attached to a cafe that my dad would manage. Oh, that's awesome. It's like my dream of dreams. And I don't know when it'll happen. I don't know where it'll happen. I don't think it's here. I don't think it's in New York. I don't Mm -hmm. know where. But I just keep that little seed in the back of my head of you're working toward that and you don't know when it's going to happen, but when it's right, it'll be right. And you just just work until you get there. And that'll be kind of like, you know, the that's like my overall, like, you know, where I want to do that and then retire with that and stuff like that. So the cream on top. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. You know, that's like what this is all for in my head. And it might take me another 15, 20 years. I don't know. Yeah. But, but I don't care. I'm just going to keep going slow and keep telling people, no, I don't need a blog and yep. <laughs> just, <laughs> just keep going and just do my thing. Just if you, if you like, yeah, trust your gut, take your time and, um, and enjoy, enjoy it and learn as much as you possibly can. You don't ever know as much as you think that you, that you think you do. There's always more to learn. Yes. I love it though. The passion, like to really want it. And to be okay with having it take time. I think a lot of people want instant success. Who doesn't, right? But but really, you don't want that. It's not it's not as great when you achieve something if it's just you know. I mean, you, yeah, it just it's just not. There's no longevity to that. Right. There's just not. There's just not. There's no future in that. You need mm-hmm. to like just take your time and enjoy it, and you know. Yep. The best you can, you know. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us your journey and in sharing with me. I didn't even know catching me up in your life. I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't know you'd moved and <laughs> all the things, but this has been so fun. If our listeners want to find you, we know there's no blog, but where's the best place to find you? So you can um, the, uh, just, you know, on Instagram, um, if you need to, it's better to send me an email. There's, you know, the little button on my Instagram profile. You can just click that, shoot me an email. That's the best way to uh, to get in touch. I'll, I will be launching a website, not a blog, but a website. Mm-hmm. Um, if hopefully next month, it, I worked with a really my um, very talented friend Victoria to make a website, and so that'll be cool to like have. A, it'll be juicyjuice.com, very original. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be looking for that. All right, good luck with that, and thanks again for being Thank, here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I love talking shop, so thanks. That was fun. Geese up. I think I said that right. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're seriously a delight to chat with. Your work is amazing. If you all haven't seen it, you've got to go take a look. It's just bright, beautiful, uniquely juicy juices. I hope you all get the chance to meet him in real life as well one day. He's just as fun and personable in real life as he was on the podcast. So if you are enjoying the podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And also go ahead and rate the podcast and leave a review. Share what resonates with you. Let me know if there's something you'd like to hear on the podcast that you haven't heard or if there's a guest that you'd like to hear from. I love hearing from my listeners. I actually do take the suggestions that I hear and create future podcast episodes from them. So please do reach out, leave a review, subscribe. Let me know what you'd like to hear and what's helping. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Friday right here on the Craft to Career podcast. 